Shabbat Shalom, Good Shabbos, Boker Tov, Chag Sameach, Purim. It's great to see uh, those of us who are here uh, on site and also uh, God bless those who are, are, are coming in through our live stream. It's great to have you today and uh, we look forward to having a wonderful, uh, not only celebrating Shabbat today, but also we're celebrating Purim. Today's on Shushan Purim, the second day of Purim. Uh, so uh, we're going to begin with our Torah service, and then we'll have our Shabbat celebration service. So let me pray. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Heavenly Father, just thank you for this day. At this, what, uh, this is the day the Lord has made. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it, Lord. So we just love you. We thank you, God, for just a great time for, to be in your house, to worship you today on this Shabbat and Shushan Purim. And uh, Lord, just I pray you be with those who are on their way to the service today. Get the, everybody here safely. We pray everybody will be blessed. Uh, we pray, God, you bring new people to come uh, join us today and people to get back in the habit of uh, being back in, uh, on site in the congregation. So we pray that. Uh, uh, that uh, you'll, you'll just help us all with that. And those, Lord, because of health reasons or maybe they had conflicts, couldn't actually be on site, we pray that you be with them, uh, Lord, even if they're watching from home. And uh, if anyone's not feeling well today, Lord, just put your healing hand upon them. And uh, we also pray for the peace of Yerushalayim and your peace upon the United States and all peoples. So bless the service and bless each person, Lord, and any part of the service that they have today. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Okay, so we're going to begin our Torah service at this time. This week's parsha is Tetzaveh, which means you shall command, and that's uh, in, we're still in Shemot or Exodus, uh, chapter 27, verse 20, going through chapter 30, verse 10. Ya'amot Kalman ben Abalab. Kent Weissman's going to come and bless the Torah for us. Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbos and Hak Sameah. Purim was wonderful last night, so we, we greet you all with that, and hopefully, you all have some humatashin. Bar hu et adonai hamborach. Bar Baruch Adonai HaBarach Le'olam Va'ed Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Mat Bar-Kharbanu Mikol Hamim V'natan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed to be the Lord forever and ever to be blessed. Amen. Yamon Mikhail ben Herzl. Now Pastor Michael will be singing, will be chanting from the Torah. Thank you. Okay. Well, as I said, uh, this week's Parsha is Tetzaveh, and actually the second word that I'm going to chant is... Uh, is Tetzaveh, so that's where we get the name from the parasha from. And Tetzaveh is a, a, a form of Tzava, which is the Hebrew verb to command. And so we get, we get the very familiar noun mitzvah comes from this, from this verb. Ve'ata Tetzaveh Et bene Yisrael, vayichu elecha shemen zayit zak katit lama or leha alot ner tamid. 
Be'ohel Mo'ed Mi'chutz La'parochet Asher Al Ha'edut Ya'aroch Oto Aharon Uvanam Me'erev Ad Boker Lifne Adonai Chukat Olam Ledorotam Me'et B'nai Yisrael Okay, and now the English of what I just did in the Hebrew. And this is, uh, again, Shemot or Exodus 27, verses 20 and 21. You shall charge the sons of Israel that they bring you clear oil of beaten oil, excuse me, beaten olives for the light to make a lamp burn continually. So that's called about the ner tamid, you know, the eternal light that was supposed to be burning in the tabernacle. In the tent of meeting, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall keep it in order from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a perpetual, perpetual statute throughout their generations for the sons of Israel. Ya'amot Moshe ben Don. Now, uh, Andrew Jackson is going to be sharing with us uh, our drosh or teaching today for the parasha. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much for coming. I hope this finds you having a great morning. Thank you again for coming and worshiping with us. I think it's so cool that we get to gather together, uh, either virtually or physically, because of our common belief that there is a God, that there is a benevolent being outside of our dimension that cares for you, that has sent his own son to die for you so that you can approach his throne with confidence, with grace, and with purpose. And that's what we do this morning. We're worshiping together. We're celebrating together that reality. This morning's Parsha, this morning's Torah portion is right out of the book of Exodus. It's called Tetzeve, and it is a beautiful picture of our atonement, of the sacrificial love that God has for you. Freedom. Think about freedom. Freedom this morning is something that has captivated my thought, captivated my heart. I think freedom is that ancient pulsating star that we can all agree to. I think of Braveheart when, when Mel Gibson is screaming out, freedom! And it's something that we can all appreciate. From 1776, when we're celebrating our freedom from Britain, to 1948, a massive year for us, when Israel became its own nation, freedom dominates our heart and mind. Freedom is something that we fight for, that we strive to preserve. Even today, with racial injustice, we are pushing the envelope on freedom, making sure that all people can experience equality. And that is a noble cause. That is something that we can all agree to. Well, the book of Exodus is probably one of the first epic stories of freedom. If you think about Exodus, Exodus vivifies the freedom of the ancient Israelites from the bondage to Pharaoh. They escaped with vivid displays of power. Think about the plagues descending on the Egyptians, causing, forcing Pharaoh to let this people go. Think about the pillar of fire leading the people by night and the pillar of cloud by day. Exodus is also a story of tragedy. We see political murder. We see genocide. It is not a boring story at all. It's almost like a graphic novel, to be honest with you. That is until chapter 19. Once you hit chapter 19, it quickly turns from a story to codes, to chapter after chapter, verse after verse of law. You know, I think about this and I wonder, why would God do this? Why would God take the Israelites from bondage to Pharaoh and then what seems to be switch it or exchange it to bondage to Moses? 
what was physical bondage now is metaphysical servitude. You can't do this. You must do that. If this happens, do this. If this doesn't happen, don't do that. Chapter after chapter, verse after verse, it's law after law. In fact, the Bible devotes two chapters to the whole creation of the universe, but he gives 50 chapters to what's called the sacrificial system or the Levitical law that dictates with incredible detail how the Israelites were to live their life. If you're like me and gravitate to the big picture and suffer through the details, questions abound on why God would do this. What I'd like to propose to you this morning is what if, bear with me here, what if the sacrificial system was never the answer? What if it was never intended to be the answer? The answer to what, you might ask? The answer to the fact that something is wrong. Can you agree with me that there is something wrong in the world today? Do you have to teach a child how to lie? Do you have to go very far to see suffering on an insurmountable level? Would you not agree that you yourself are prone to vice? Well, the ancient people, I think of Adam and Job and even the patriarchs Isaac, they dealt with this problem through sacrifice, through the shedding of blood, through taking an animal and sacrificing it to the Lord. What Moses did, God through Moses, is he codified that sacrificial system. Why? Why would we have to kill an animal for this? Why would we have to seek out a way to atone for our sin in such a vivid, grotesque way? I think it's exactly that. I think this was a painting, not an answer. I think that the sacrificial system was a painting, not an answer. When you have to slay an animal, it's not a pretty picture. It's very grotesque. If you love animals, it's very sad. And we should all love animals. It's a sad thing. And it pictures, it vivifies how awful suffering is. How awful the payment for sin must be. In Hebrews 9, we see the answer. The Authors and the apostles of the Brit Chadashah, the New Covenant, they point to the answer. And who is the answer? The answer is Yeshua Messiah. I'll read for you right out of Hebrews 9, 26, where it says, Yeshua put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There are some faith traditions today that have a continual sacrifice of mass and confession. That every week there's a sacrifice. And this stems right out of the book of Exodus. In Exodus 29, we see Moses lay out that every day there was a morning sacrifice and there was an evening sacrifice. The morning sacrifice was for adoration, worship. The evening sacrifice was for expiation or apology. And so some faith traditions have taken that and they're just reflecting that today by having a continual sacrifice of mass or confession or both. But Hebrews tells us that Yeshua paid this price once and for all and it has been fulfilled so that we don't have to offer sacrifices day in and day out. Why? Because it was never the answer. It was always the picture painting for us the grotesqueness of sin and the sacrificial love of God. So this morning, as we're thinking about all these things, my action to you is choose this day freedom. Do not choose bondage. That is not what God wants for you. God does not want you to be in bondage to doing right, to striving for perfection, to doing things that might make you appear good before God. He just does not want that. What he wants you to experience is freedom. How do we get this freedom? Well, we trust in Yeshua. We trust that Yeshua's sacrifice is sufficient. We trust that his righteousness, that his sacrifice 
imputes to us, which is another word for brings onto us his righteousness, so that when we stand before the Father, he does not see you. He sees Yeshua's righteousness wrapped in you, so that he can experience and accept your worship, your presence, and he can enter into a loving relationship with you. So I pray this morning, if you have not already, choose freedom, choose Yeshua. For those of us who have been walking with Yeshua for years, don't ever, ever grow tired of that message that you have freedom in Yeshua. It doesn't stop. It's continual until you pass and be with the Lord. So choose this day freedom. Be well. I pray that you have a wonderful morning and continue to worship with us. Thank you so much. I think we'll give it back over now to the leadership to uh, wrap up the Torah service. Blessings. Thank you, Brother Andrew. That was a very powerful drosh, especially this time as we're entering um, soon to be Passover. Uh, thank you. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher natan lanu Torah emet Vachaye olam no tabetochenu Baruch atah Adonai no ten ha Torah Amen. Now we'll have uh, Nick Vetter to do the uh, Mida and also the Hatzikadosh. Thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to worship you in the midst of the assembly of your people. May you send uh, your rain from heaven upon the land to bring up the crops and give us water to drink. And may you send the water of your Holy Spirit upon our hearts today. Open our lips that our mouths may declare your praise. Nekadesh et shimcha belam, kishem shemak tashim atobish me marom, kakatu veyad ni vieka vekaraze elze, viyam mahar, kadosh, 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 adonai tsevot, melocho haaretz kevodo. Azba korash kado adir kazak bashvim ko mit nasim lermat serafim lermat ambruk yemiru paruk evodan anai mim kamo mim kam kama keno tefiak tim lokalenu ki makakim naknu lak matai tim lok bitzion bekarob yemenu leolam yetishkon. Tihit kadava tihit kadash betok Yerushalayim ireka ledor vador ul netzak ul netzak netzakim vayeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyeyey
Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world, which he has created according to his will. Yitkada, Yitkada, Shemerava, Pamadi Vrakiru Tevium Lik Makute, Bakaye Konavion Mekum, Ufkaye de Kobit Israel, Bagala, Bagala, Uvisman Karib. Vimiru Amen. Yahesh Mira Bamibora, Leola Mumia Maya, Yit Barak, Yit Barak, Vistabak, Vit Boar, Vit Ramam, Vit Nasse, Vit Hadar, Vit Tale, Vit Talash, Mira Kudashabriku, Leila Minko Birkata Vishirata. Tus pekara vane kemara da hamiran biama vimiru amen. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he has created according to his will. Oh, say shalom bim romav. Uya se shalom aleinu Vea ko Yisrael Vimru, imiru, amen O se shalom bimru mab Uya se shalom aleinu Vea ko Yisrael Vimru, imiru, amen. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom. Shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom. Shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom. Shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael Yase shalom, yase shalom Shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael Yase shalom, yase shalom Shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael Quickly, I forgot to mention that this also serves as our mortar's Kaddish for today. So all who are in mourning, may, you be, may your hearts be comforted and may the Lord meet you in your need today. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you. Well, we are celebrating Purim today. Today is a Shushan Purim. And uh, we had a wonderful time last night uh, reading through the, the book of Esther. We read the whole Megillah last night. In fact, in fact Shelley was one of our readers uh, last night. We had a number of children and some others. So we had a great time. I know not all of you had an opportunity to uh, do that last night. So we're just going to have a little snippet of it today. We're just going to do two verses and give you a chance to make the sound effects that we tradition. Uh, you might wonder, who am I? I don't know who I am. No, uh, who am I? I am Mordecai's rabbi. You didn't know about that, but he had a rabbi uh, there in Susa, so I'm, I'm his rabbi. But uh, anyway, in Esther chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, we're going to read uh, those verses, and you'll hear all three of our main characters mentioned. And so just to remind you, when, when we hear Mordecai, what do we say? Yay. yay! For Mordecai, yay, he's a good guy, okay. And when we hear Esther, what do we say? Lula. Boo! Okay, all right, so you got it. So when I mention the names, that's the sound effects we do. Okay, this is Esther 8, beginning of verse 1. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman... Boo! The enemy of the Jews to Queen Esther. Ooh la la. 
And Mordecai, yay, came before the king. For Esther, ooh la la, had disclosed what he was to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had taken away from Haman, boo, and gave it to Mordecai, yay. And Esther, ooh la la, set Mordecai, yay, over the house of Haman, boo. Okay, all right, that gave you a little taste of it. So next year, join us for the whole thing. All right, we're going to transition into our Shabbat celebration service at this time. And uh, so let me just pray. And Lord, just thank you for this time for us to worship you, not only through liturgy, but singing worship and through the preaching of your word today. And pray that you would be glorified uh, through this, Lord. So bless uh, each person that will be involved with us in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Okay, so Elijah Cohen's going to come up and lead us in the Baruch and Shema. I think it's going to come up. Barehu et Adonai Hamvor. Oh, please stand. Barehu et Adonai Hamvorach. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vaed. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vaed. Bless the Lord who is worthy to be blessed. Bless the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Now for the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Leolam Vaed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha Bechol Levavcha Uvechol Nafshecha and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Yeshua said, on these two commandments depend the whole Torah and all the prophets. Thank you and praise God. Chag Sameach, happy Purim. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's celebrate Purim together. We're going to start out with a song, a traditional song, um, called A Wicked, Wicked Man. It's about Haman. It's about the story of Esther and God's faithfulness to the Jewish people through a very troubling time. So let's sing this song together. Oh, once there was... Once there was a wicked, wicked man, Haman was his name, sir. He would have murdered all the Jews, but they were not to blame, sir. Oh, today will Mary, Mary be. Oh, today will Mary, Mary be. Oh, today will Mary, Mary be. And now some Haman ties And Esther was. Was the lovely queen, King Ahasuerus? When Haman said he'd kill us all, oh my, how he did scare us! Oh, today will Mary, Mary be? Oh, today will Mary, Mary be? Oh, today will Mary, Mary be? And now some Haman but Mordecai. Mordecai, her cousin bull, said, what a dreadful chutzpah. If Haman carries out his threat, as Haman, God will judge, sir. Oh, today will Mary, Mary be. Oh, today will Mary, Mary be. Oh, today will Mary, Mary be. And now some Haman When Esther. Speaking to the 
king of Haman's plot may mention. Ha ha, he said, oh no he won't, spoil his bad intention. Oh, today will Mary Mary be, oh today will Mary Mary be, oh today will Mary Mary be, and not some He shall be as clever Mr. Smarty And high above us he'll be judged A little hanging party Oh, today will Mary Mary be Oh, today will Mary Mary be Oh, today will Mary Mary be And not some hum and talk again Of all his cruel unkind ways this little plot did cure him and don't forget we owe god thanks for the jolly feast of forum oh today will mary mary be oh today will mary mary be oh today will mary mary be and not some hum and touch and Happy Purim. Let's continue to worship the Lord. Let's praise Him with the symbols. Praise Him with your voice. Let's lift up His name. Praise Him with the symbols. Praise Him with the dance. Praise Him with the shofar. Praise Him with your hands. Praise Him with the timbrel. Praise Him with the harp, praise Him with the drum and the flute, praise Him with your heart. Him for his glory and power, praise him with guitars, praise him in the battle, praise him in the storm, praise him for the victories won, praise him with this song. Hallelujah, 
Let's continue to sing to him. We're going to sing a psalm right now, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's sing this together. is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restoreth my soul can we sing that first verse again right out of the scriptures pray it to him is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restoreth my soul and yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I fear no evil Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restoreth my soul father you do restore our soul you do give us life, Lord. It's so good to know that we have a shepherd who cares for our needs, who protects us, who looks out for us, who is intricately involved in our day-to-day, -day, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for giving us Purim, that we can be reminded of your faithfulness to our people. We have certainly had our challenges, but we have a mighty God who cares for us and who stands with us. So we worship you this morning. We lift up your name. We make much of you, Father. Pray that in response, we would now have a clean heart. If there's anything we need to do to ask for forgiveness or reconcile our relationship with you, we pray that through our worship this morning, that might be accomplished. So give us clean hearts. Give us pure hands, Father. Make a 
first verse again we bow our hearts we bend our knees oh spirit come make us humble we turn our eyes from evil things oh lord we cast down our idols Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. what it means to be reconciled to God so that you can have that relationship. This next song that we're going to sing is called Ever Be. In response to his sacrificial love for us, we want to respond with praise and worship that his glory would be on our lips at all times. Let's sing together. Ever Be. And 
beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my kindness makes us whole you shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own you're making me like you clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes for you will have your bride Continue to praise God with me, with our congregation at Adat Yeshua on this awesome Purim. Chag Sameach, be well. We're going to now hand it back over for announcements. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach Purim, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. It's nice to see everyone. If you please take a look at your yellow bulletin, we have the announcements in the back, and we also have a list of our Havaras in the back. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our essential team who dil diligently come early almost every Saturday to help us out. And if you would like to be a part of this awesome team to serve the Lord with us, we invite you to do that. And please let me know if you're interested in doing that. Next Friday, we will have our congregational pre prayer meeting. That will be March the 5th at 8 to 9.30 in the evening. And uh, that uh, Zoom link will be on the What's New. We did have our very, very good, very blessed Purim celebration last night, and we had about, oh, the children was just so awesome last night, and all the readers and even our sound makers did such a great job. But next week, we will going, we'll be going back to our congregational prayer meeting. Next Saturday, as usual, we will be our on-site, inside service. At 10.30, we will start 
our Torah service at 10.30, and then immediately after that, we will have our Shabbat celebration service. So we will also have our online service, and if you're coming on site, we will ask you, please, if you are not feeling well and you're sick, please stay home and enjoy the live stream at home. We do adhere to social distancing and wearing masks and everything. We have some details in the what's new and what we do require and what the health, the health department requires when we meet and so those are outlined in what's new and then also too we have have roads uh, during the week we have a list of them in the back of the bulletin and also we have a list of that under what's new if you're interested please let me know let us know let the office know and we will get you connected with those small group studies uh, thank you so much for faithfully offering your worship unto the Lord with their tithes and offerings and we do have um, uh, an offering box in the back if if you would like to, uh, to offer your worship offering unto the Lord during the service, but it will be here in the front after service. We still encourage you to give online if you're able to do that. And uh, we did have our um, statements mailed out last month, and this will be our last reminder. If you have not yet received your, your uh, donation statement, please let me know. After the service, if you need prayer, Sarah and I will be here to pray for you and also any of the elders, and we do welcome Sarah back. And so I, I was sent this back over to Pastor Mike Cohen for the sermon. Shabbat Shalom. Okay, I always tell my kids that I long for the days when you just call somebody and the phone would just ring forever because nobody has voicemail or call waiting or anything and you don't know where anybody is. I know, it's like, who wants those days? That's, that's me. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the good old bad old days. All right, let's pray. Ask God to... Bless our time together. Abba, Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for technology and for Shabbat and just for um, this community, this community that, that loves you and um, desires to know you in a deeper way. Lord, when we think of Purim, we think of deliverance and we think of those that are either being threatened or those that are in bondage, those that are being threatened physically, in bondage spiritually, and those that are in bondage also spiritually. Um, I think of Danny's prayer last night about asking for the captives to be released, those that are imprisoned, um, those are being persecuted. And although The Jewish people are the subject of much persecution, and especially in the book of Purim, we also think of all people. We think of the body of Messiah, and we ask for their deliverance, um, their uh, preservation of their testimony, of our testimony, to empower us spiritually, Lord. And as you empower us spiritually, Lord, and as we seek to follow and serve you, let us do so morally, justly, and as a good testimony. Uh, let us be followers in a way that draw men and women to you and not repel. Lord, we just praise you and we thank you. Lord, I lift up anybody here this morning 
and anybody who's listening, anybody who's in need, anybody who's hurting, I pray, Lord God, that you would bless them, encourage them, strengthen them, and deliver them. I pray, Lord God, for anyone who is maybe suffering uh, financially or has a loved one who does not yet know you. I pray, Lord God, for their spirit, their eyes to be opened and for them to be delivered from sin and from death and to have eternal life and to be on the path, Lord, to abundant living. Lord, I pray for all of us here this morning that we would be on that path of abundant living, um, of, uh, of following you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and not doing so out of selfish ambitions or need our own wants, but Lord, just looking to you and saying it's all about you, just like the, the protagonist in the book of Esther, Lord, to just follow you and just say, you know what, even though what I might be going through is not my ideal, it's what you've called me to. And Lord, let me serve you in a way that brings glory and honor to you. That's our heart, it's my heart, that's the congregation's heart. Lord, help our hearts to be true to that devotion, that ambition. We love you, Lord, we praise you. And Lord, we just pray during this season of, of COVID, as, as I hope and pray we're transitioning out and into a, a glorious new future. Lord, I pray that you would guide us and teach us and train us in how to, to navigate these waters um, and get back to where we can worship together, serve you together, eat together, fellowship together, uh, encourage one another face to face um, without the barriers and the obstacles that we face at this moment. But thank you, Lord, for the lessening of these barriers and obstacles. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the body of Messiah. And now, Lord, as we look into your word, we pray for your truth to be applied to our hearts. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. So I'm going to stick with um, the Purim tradition, and, or at least the Purim uh, theme, and we're going to talk about the book of Purim, so that you do have a, a handout, and uh, to the title of, or I don't think we're up yet, the title of uh, today's message is Purim, God's Covenantal Love for the Jewish People, and I want to, oh, I know why, um, Jose warned me of this, you got to turn this on for it to work, that's very important when dealing with technology. See, I don't really have a switch for my mouth. It just starts going. But I got to remember these things, you got to turn them on. Make sure the battery's working, too. Sorry about that. Like I said, pilot error. Anyway, so Purim is one of those very special holidays. Uh, it's good for young and old. And part of that is because of its rich heritage of traditions. And we went through a special tradition last night. We read the Megillah. The Megillah, the Megillah, which means the scroll, the Megillah of Esther, the scroll of Esther. And we, we cheered for Mordecai and, and Esther, and we booed Haman. And then, of course, some of you may have um, had hamantashens for food. And, of course, you know, it's uh, got to be careful with these Jewish holidays because they always could end up adding pounds. So you got <laughs> to be careful. One of the things about Jewish holidays is there's a lot of sugar and oil, uh, which is part of our tradition, which is good. Um, but be careful. And then, of course, this is the grogger, which is just, again, the celebration. And, you know, some synagogues do it for the joy. Some do it, you know, for the, you know, against Haman. Some do it to cheer. But it's all good fun. The thing, though, about tradition that we have to be careful about, and I don't want to be the naysayer, but, you know, I, I have to kind of put the, make us careful, is that traditions can sometimes obscure the greater truth, the biblical realities. And I feel like sometimes tradition with respect to Purim can, I'm not saying it does, but it can obscure the greater reality. And as you read and study this book and you do a deep dive, you'll notice that the groggers and the cheering and the hamantash and all that is not really all there is. It's not even really in there. But there's a deeper truth. And, and what jumps out, even though God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther, which is really quite you know, fascinating, and we'll, we'll talk more about that, his love is all over this book. 
his covenantal love for the Jewish people, especially in the diaspora, which means the dispersion, is all over this book. And so I want to just do a survey, so I'm going to be a little quick, um, regarding the book of Purim, and just look at God's love for his people, and, and by application for all people. And so here we have Cyrus. This is uh, the one that God called. So when the Jewish people went into exile in Babylon, into captivity, uh, God promised that Cyrus, and he called him by name, would be the one that he would use to allow the children of Israel, or really Jewish, the Judah, the southern kingdom, but the Israelites, to go back to their land to build their temple. And this is revealed to us in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. And so God's covenant love begins with him revealing his abundant mercy. Jewish people had sinned. They deserved to go into captivity. God took them to captivity for 70 years, but then he released them. And Cyrus, called by God, to allow them to go back and rebuild their temple. And it says thus, and this is just a little snippet of Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus says Adonai to his anointed, Cyrus. And that word anointed literally means Mashiach. It's from the root Messiah. So his anointed one for a specific purpose, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him so that the gates may not be shut for the sake of Jacob. Yaakov, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one. I have also called you by name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. And so we see God's mercy on his people. He's not forgotten his people. He's not abandoned them into exile. He has allowed them to come back. And, and those that came back, we see their legacy and their history in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And those that remained, we see in the story of Esther. And there are many Jews that have not yet returned to the land and are in the diaspora, the dispersion, or outside the land. And they have a story to tell, and we see that story in the book of Esther. And so this first is God's covenant love, his abounding mercy. He does not forget his people. He will not forget you. He does not forget me. And he will not allow us to remain in captivity if we rem because he has decreed that he has a plan and a purpose uh, for you and for me. And so keep looking to God and his purposes. Uh, one little note, too, is Persia is the second of four empires that rules over Jerusalem um, between the captivity, which began around 603 B.C. under Nebuchadnezzar, all the way and through the life and the ministry of Yeshua, our Messiah. And so there are four empires. Persia is the second. And, of course, Persia conquered Babylon and then was conquered later by Greece, and then Greece by Rome, and then Yeshua was born. So that's a little quick, little where we are in the history. And probably this book, Esther, was written around 450, between you know, 475, 450, around that time, B.C., so over 400 years before the birth of Yeshua, um, maybe around the time that Malachi. So this is one of the last books of the Tanakh, of the canon, the 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 Old Testament canon. The Jewish people had a very uh, big history, I should say, a vibrant history in Babylon and Persia. Kind of those names are used interchangeably for a thousand years, even to this very day. When Israel became a state in 1948, many Jews in the Middle East had to flee and return and go back to, go to, the, to, to, the, to Israel, to the Promised Land. Um, that was the state that was created. But in Iran, they were still, many thousands were still, I think there's roughly 25,000 today that are still in Iran. A vibrant, vibrant uh, history. And so, uh, a rich history, and I will talk about it in a little bit, but, but the Babylonian Talmud and some of our traditions to this very day come out of, out of Babylon and Persia. The second covenantal truth or revelation of God's love is the legal tradition. Uh, Persia 
was a nation of great legal traditions. And here we have a picture of Vashti, and Vashti is in Esther chapter 1, and Vashti gets caught in this legal tradition. So sometimes the legal tradition works for us, and sometimes it doesn't. But one of the things that God covenantal love re revealed in the empire's legal tradition is that it, it both works for and against, but legal traditions is really what we are kind of about. I mean, it's sort of the way in which unbelievers and believers can live together, in a sense, if you think about it, because we kind of live under, under the law, and then we have a place in which we can go to when we have conflicts. Now, as believers, we shouldn't need the law. We really have two laws, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So in this community, we should be following that law, but when we go out, or that Torah, uh, the Messianic Torah, all kind of brought together, but when we go out there, we have, we have these traditions. In Vashti, in Esther chapter 1, we, we see it revealed, and it's really revealed throughout this book. We see these laws, these rules being written. And, and what's really powerful is that the king doesn't do a whole lot without the laws being, laws being written and, and ratified. So I want to just look at um, Esther chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. It says, But Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs, at the king became, and the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. So they were having a party, as you know. I want to go too deep into the details here. But they were having a party, and the king and his advisors said, Hey, let's call Vashti in. Let's look at her. Let's see what she's got going on, and she refuses, and so she doesn't obey the king's command. And what's interesting is that in verse 13, it says, then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in the law and judgment, the men next to him being Karshena, all their, the names of the advisors, I don't want to go in there, but, but when she didn't come, he turned to his legal advisors, and he said, what should we do? And they wrote a law. And so, unfortunately, the law doesn't always work for us or against us, but the covenant mercy about the law is that it does create boundaries and guideposts, and, and it's a tutor for those of us to lead us to Messiah. And again, as we live in a, a fallen world, it allows us, as, as history progresses, to at least have a place in which we can air our grievances and we're going to see how that plays out for the Jewish people as we move forward. As I said a moment ago, the Jewish people lived in Persia for centuries. And as they lived there, they developed legal traditions. Some good, some, some not so good. But those legal traditions have been codified in the Iranian, it says here Iranian Talmud, but really the, it's called the Bavli. And there's over three million words between the Iranian or Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. And these are all laws and codifications um, of, of uh, Jewish instruction, Jewish tradition. We see in Esther chapter 2, really, to me, one of the most important of these covenantal principles, God's covenantal laws being on display for us, and that's in Esther's goodness. That Esther's goodness really is, is God showing us and revealing his covenantal law, that, it, that God really works and wants to work through the good, through the good. Esther is not just some young, pretty girl dressed up in makeup that people see and go, oh my goodness, and want to marry her. And sometimes I think it's unfortunate that that's kind of what comes out as we look at the, the story or the narrative of Purim. But that's not really what it, what it is at all. She is the heroine. She's really the heroine or the hero of this story. She's one of the few characters in the scriptures where nothing bad is ever mentioned about her. There's no bad story revealing or something that we see her flaws. She is just a, a powerful picture of goodness and beauty. Let's see, in um, Esther chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordechai, the son of Ya'er, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah, the king of Judah, 
whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Verse 7, And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful. So the word fair is yafeh, which is obviously is Hebrew for pretty, and beautiful is tov, tov, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together into Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of Haggai, the keeper of the women. Verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihal, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except when Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So you can start to see the presentation. She's somebody whose parents died at a young age. She's somebody who's in captivity, whose uncle came with the early captives, or at least whose family obviously came with the early captives and probably heard the stories of Jerusalem. And here she is, an orphan with her cousin. And, and now she's being taken and the scriptures is taken into the king's harem in order to choose a wife, which is a law of the Persians. Verse 16. Am I on verse 16? Yes. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his royal house into the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women. Now, if you pause there, you're wondering, you know, why does he love her more than all the women? Is it just because she's attractive, good-looking, quiet? What, what is the reason? And it says here, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And that word for one is, is yato. It's the verb for good. She is winning by her character, by her, the presentation of her life. She is winning the hearts of the pagans, really. She is winning the hearts through her character. She's not whining. She's not complaining. She's not making it difficult. Notice she said she just went in with what she was given. She didn't say she needed more. She just did what she, she obeyed. But she did so in a winsome way and, and, and won the favor. So that when she was chosen, she wasn't chosen for, for abuse. She was chosen by love. It says the king loved her. And so I believe God, this is, this is God, our covenant-keeping God. He wants to win the world through Yatov. He wants to win the world through people who are willing to be morally exemplary. That's really what good, goodness is. It's the state of being morally exemplar. And of course, we know we can't do that without the Holy Spirit. We know we need to be empowered by Yeshua. We know we need to have, as, as Andrew said, we need to have his, his covenant forgiveness through the blood, the death, burial, and resurrection. We need to be a new creation. But we can't just say, well, okay, I'm a new creation, my sins are forgiven, and that's it. We, we should aspire, when that Holy Spirit fills us, we should aspire in our new creation to be morally good, to desire to win the hearts of people, not through complaining and saying, woe is me, which she could have done, and we would have said, yeah, that makes sense, of course. How, you know, they're taking you into a harem, doctoring you up, ripping you out of your childhood, your parents are already dead, you have no choices, why are you doing this? And she did it really, I think, for two reasons. One, I mean, in other words, what I'm saying is what inspired her goodness? One is her uncle, I keep saying uncle, cousin, uncle, <laughs> I think I get confused by that, but Mordecai. But notice that the Bible says Mordecai the Jew. That's very interesting. Why would the Bible call him Mordecai the Jew? <laughs> it bugs me. I mean, I'm like, don't, you know, 
Mordechai the Jewish person, Mordechai the Jew, but I think that's also part of her motivation is her people. She's taken from her life several times, the life of being the daughter of her parents, the life of being a child in the land, the life of living with, with Mordechai, and now she's taken and brought into a harem, and she does so out of obedience to, to Mordechai, but also because it says the Jew, out of obedience to, for her people. She is morally exemplar. She lives in the state of goodness in order to honor her people and her, who she is as a person, and that's what we need to be. As believers in Yeshua, we need to be followers. We need to aspire to that. Not, not you know, it's not a, oh, such a burden. No, it should be a joy to do that, to do that. And, you know, um, Corey Temboom, I think, is an example of that. She was taken from her home, from her father, from her sister. Eventually, her sister went with her, but she was taken out of her life into a concentration camp. Her sister died, her father died on a different route, probably in his concentration camp. Why was she taken? Because of who her father was, not just her earthly father, but her heavenly father, but also because of the Jewish people, because she loved the Jewish people like Esther. She also sought to live a morally exemplar, a, a life in the state of goodness. And of course, we can't do that without the forgiveness of sin through Yeshua, but, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But we have to agree with that. We're moral free agents. We don't just live by the law of cause and effect. We're not just a product of our gene pool. We're not just a product of our environment. Ah, oh, it's, it's who I am. It's how I was made. It's this. It's the environment. It's the, that person was mean and rude to me. You know, again, look at Esther. Look at this book. God wants his covenant of love wants to reveal his desire. He is a good God. We say God is good, and he loves the people who want to serve him in goodness. Again, he knows our flaws. He knows our nature. He knows our struggles. A righteous man falls seven times and gets up. I believe it's Proverbs 29, verse 28. It says, do you see a man or a person who is good in what he does? He will stand before kings. Well, look at Esther. She was good. What did she do? She was good in being good. You know, maybe you disagree with me, and that's fine. But as I look at the scriptures and I look at the character and I see her go through her life and her ordeal, I see somebody who is at least aspiring to do what's right, to do the good, to be the good. So let's, let's just make that desire, knowing that we're not perfect. It's not about perfection. I've said this many times. It's about direction. What is the direction of your life? What are you hungering and thirsting for? Remember, Yeshua said, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He didn't just say it's for those that are living the good life. You know, sometimes it's harder to hunger and thirst for righteousness when you're living the good life. You know, a lot of times it's, it's, it's more doable when things aren't so good. So don't look at your environment. Don't blame your genetics. Look to the Lord. You are a new creation. And let him give you that desire, that hunger. As we move on in the book, we see God's covenant of love is also revealed through Mordecai's position. Mordecai's position. Here's a picture of Mordecai. He's seated at the gate twice in Esther chapter 2, verse 19. And again, I believe in Esther 2, uh, verse 21, it says he's seated at the gate. The gate is the place in which decisions are made. It's a place of importance. And he's able to go to the gate. The first time in verse 19, he hears the plan of Big Tan and Teresh wanting to kill the king, and he reports it. And he actually reports it through Esther, or Esther signs off on it, so she's part of that as well. And then the second time, uh, he's at the gate as well. And I'll, we'll go ahead and read this. <clears throat> It says, Esther 2.21, in those days while Mordecai was sitting at the gate, okay, this is a big ton and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the doorway became angry and conspired to assassinate the king. So God's covenant love is that the Jewish people are elevated. You know, I've talked a lot about Esther and her importance and the fact that she is the hero of the story. Well, of course, she's the hero, and Mordecai, in my view, is a hero. 
So they're both heroes. And Mordechai is the example of the exceptional individual, driven, hardworking, good. He's the example of that exceptional Jewish person throughout history. The Jewish people, by God's grace and his covenant of love, seem to rise up and be in places of authority and power. And, and part of that is to help protect their people. And part of that is to be good citizens. And part of that is just the internal drive of, of people, of all of us. And so he is that beautiful example. But he's also flawed and needs a savior, as we all do. And sometimes we have to remember that, too, with the Jewish people. There is no dual covenant. We all come to salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. But we can still say, look at this remarkable person. And we can thank God for this person. But God elevates his people. And Mordechai is also an exemplar person. God is elevated to a position of authority. This is Henry James Simon, Jewish man, uh, a philanthropist. I think he's the sixth wealthiest man in uh, Berlin during the time of Kaiser Wilhelm II. My wife claims him as a relative. That's the difference between me and Lisa. Her relatives are wealthy philanthropists. My relatives are schmata salesmen. <laughs> so, ra that's rags, rags, okay, rags salesman in Yiddish. And so, this is a philanthropist, but what's really special is he lived at the gate. He came to what's known as Kaiser Wilhelm II's round table and advised the Kaiser and advised him on both Jewish issues and also on issues of the German state. And so, God's covenant love, the foundation of his love, is that the Jews, especially those in the diaspora, throughout the ages have been elevated to positions of power. And of course, we should remain humble. It's just God's love. And, and the Jewish people make up, I, I think it's like 0.02% of the population, which in one respect is amazing that they're so influential and so prominent. It goes to God, but also they're in a state of vulnerability. And so I believe God in his mercy and grace rises them up to help kind of work through them and, and protect them. And so this is another example of that. This is in, in Esther chapter 3. We see Haman's plan is developed. And how do you find God's covenant love in Haman's plan uh, to destroy the Jewish people? And it's really, it's really difficult. But I see it in that God's covenant love is revealed in exposing Haman's anti-Semitism. Haman's anti-Semitism doesn't really come into fruition until there is mechanism in places that can ultimately stop it, with Esther as the queen and Mordechai in a position at the gate where he can hear and, and, and participate. Now, unfortunately, in a sense, Mordechai, uh, you could say, kind of helps stir this up uh, by not bowing, which is a kind of a difficult concept to understand in the sense that, you know, but Mordechai uh, would not bow to Haman, uh, probably saw some character flaw or some part of the, the Jewish tradition again, you know, not wanting to worship, uh, violate one of the commandments of worship. And so uh, Haman probably required more than what was necessary as a, as a place of respect. And, and Haman goes further. And instead of just being upset with Mordechai, He's upset with all the Jewish people. And in this, in Esther chapter 3, God shows us, he shows us the template of anti-Semitism. He shows us how to, and not just anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a foundation, but really any assault on a minority culture within a majority culture. And how we have to be, as followers of Yeshua, on guard for it. In Esther chapter 3, verse 5, and when Haman saw that Mordechai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordechai alone. So his, his hostility wasn't just for an individual, which even that would have been uh, wrong, right? But here he's going after a whole class of people. Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordechai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, or as my brother and I like to say, Ahasuerus. 
That's the way we learned it in our synagogue and home congregation. You know, the other day my brother was, this is an aside, he was at our house. We were, you know, having Shabbat together. And, um, you know, he said the word Ahashverosh. And I'm like, oh, wow, you say that too. You know, I think we have this joke every few years to remind her that, you know, when I first came to faith, I'm like, who is Ahashverosh? Who are they talking about? Oh, you mean Ahashverosh. Okay, same person. It's just the English transliteration. But anyway... So Haman sought to destroy all the Jews um, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. And then we see here in verse 7 through 8, in the first month, and, and this is really the template. This is a theme, sadly, that anti-Semites will use uh, throughout history. And I'll just skip down to verse 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. It's, it's singling out the class of people, uh, mostly the, a minority that can't defend itself or appears vulnerable for persecution or extinction, genocide. And of course, we saw just as early as World War II uh, for the Jewish people, we saw this, this same template. And we need to be on guard against it. Hmm. Where is it? Where am I? Oh, did I start? Oh, wow. Okay. I must have been, there you go. Pilot error. Anyway. So I wasn't, when I was reading, okay, so there was the template in verse 8, but here we have, I don't know whether to hold it or not, but here we have a reminder that we need to stop the hate. We have to be against hate. We are the people of love, okay? We can't tolerate sin. I mean, and then there's the balance. How do we deal with sin? Well, the Holy Spirit is going to tell us and teach us how to do that, but ultimately, we have to stop the hatred of a class of people. We have to stop stereotyping people. And of course, this is a sign against stopping the hate of anti-Semitism, but we have to be on guard against this template. And so God shows his covenant of love, his grace, by allowing us to see early on and be able to be wise and expose. Now I just can't even, there it is, expose it. Okay, next we have We have a, a, a powerful picture of religious disciplines going on in this. And God reveals his covenant love through these religious practices. Through these religious practices. And in, in, this, in Esther chapter 4 and 5, we see the fast that Esther calls. We see two important religious practices. We see the practice of mourning, of rending your coat. And that's what Mordecai does when he hears about the law that, that Haman uh, creates with King Ahasuerus, but we also see the practice of fasting and, and praying, of, of seeking God through fasting and praying. And again, God's name is not mentioned here, but at least we see this discipline and we see the desire to move on the heart of the king. And, and this is important for us. And we have to be careful, too, that when we, we follow the form of, of a religious discipline, that it, the form doesn't become the function. Okay, we're not pleasing God necessarily through the form of the religious discipline. It's through the function, through what's behind it. The desire to move the heart of the king. The desire to be on the same page with the Lord, with God, in order to facilitate some, some kind of uh, result, godly result. And so that's what we see here. We see the call to a fast... And, uh, and, and we see the sackcloth and ashes in verse 1 as a reminder that we call evil, evil, and good, good. And then we see the call to the fast. We see it as a desire to move the heart of God, move the heart of the king, move the heart of history to a place in which God's will can be done. And so we have to, we have to practice these practices, but we have to do so in a way where it's about the function not the form. We're not getting brownie points by doing a fast, but we're moving the heart of God. We're moving the heart of history. We're moving the heart of the individual by God's grace so that um, 
we can see God's will being done, not our own. This is a picture of Jewish religious practice. One of the things that um, Jewish people do to uh, you know, a beautiful, a uh, deep extent is that they do a lot of praying um, and also a lot of fasting. We have a number of fast days on the Jewish calendar and we do parts of that liturgy here every Shabbat where we celebrate um, these religious practices. But, but it's not, again, about the form. It's about the function. It's about an avenue of drawing closer to God, receiving his will, and seeing his will being performed in the world today. We also see this moving on the heart. We see, um, let's see, God's, we see God's covenant of love um, through the king's acceptance through the fact that God's will does work. God's will does move in the hearts of leaders. You know, we, we look around today and we see our leaders and maybe they're doing things that we don't like. You know, Haman and King Ahasuerus, King Ahasuerus, they created a law to destroy the Jews on the 12th day of Adar. What did they do? Did they get in the streets? Did they you know, start throwing rocks and riot? No, they rent their clothes, recognizing there was a problem, and then they prayed. And then with the courage, they went, they decided to go before the king. They decided to go before the king. And um, I'm just gonna go back and read the verse in verse 16 and 17 because it's a really powerful picture of, it's about the function. The form moves the function of the heart so that we can be courageous and live moral lives, live lives of goodness. Verse 16, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa or Shushan and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days. That's a powerful fast in and of itself, but that fast in the desert where people aren't drinking, you know, eight glasses of water every day and, and the dryness and the heat, uh, that's a really, uh, that's a dangerous fast, I believe, in general. Three days and three nights, and I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. If I per See, move in her own heart to do God's will. And then in verse, chapter 5, verse 1, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance of the palace. You can see here, there's just a powerful way. You know, how do we move on the heart of authorities? How do we move on the heart of the king? Or in this case, a mayor or a governor. We see a template. We see a picture here. We see somebody who's first ready to go before God in humility and, and make sure their heart is right. And then on the third day, the courage to enter the throne room against a law, a legal tradition, whether you agree with it or not, that's the guardrail, that's the guard post. And she goes into the throne room, approaches the throne room without the scepter, without the call. And she could be exiled or, or uh, killed. Capital punishment. And yet, she's prepared to do that. She says, if I perish, I perish. Verse 2, and when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor, and that word is grace, she won grace in his sight, and, beheld, and held, out the, held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king said to her, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you up to half the... Uh, the kingdom. And so we can win the hearts. Paul says in 1 Timothy, I believe it's chapter 2, verse 1, he says that we are to pray for our authorities. We're to pray for them, especially those who are not believers. I mean, I know in my life, I've had a habit to really pray for the believers <laughs> who are in power, but we got to pray for the unbelievers. We got to pray. This is a, an unbelieving king, you know, and his leadership to move the hearts 
And then through the courage of that conviction, we follow the call of God. If I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. Now, in, in terms of the Jewish people, you know, winning the king's acceptance by diligence and inspiration and, and following, you know, doing the, 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 the right lifestyle, we see this is kind of a, a pie shape here of Jewish Nobel Prize winners. So again, God's covenantal grace being accepted in the community. Jewish people, even though they make up 0.2% of the, or 0.02% of the population, they have 20% of the Nobel Prizes. And, and just recently winning Nobel Prizes in chemistry and economics. And that's not, that is not, that is not um, by, uh, by just their hard work. That's by divine sovereignty. That's by God's grace. That's by God preserving and protecting the Jewish people until the day of their national salvation. Next we have God revealing his, his grace, his covenantal grace in the fall of Haman. Not just at exposing anti-Semitism, but at some point we realize that those that are against the Jewish people, those who would come against the Jewish people, will ultimately fall. God's covenant love is revealed in Haman's fall. Esther chapter 6, verse 13. And we see several examples of this moving from Esther chapter 6 and 7. Esther chapter 6, really quickly, is, a, is really powerful satire. You know, the, the, this, is, this is one of the best chapters, I think, in the scriptures. I mean, in terms of comedy and satire, and it's a very serious situation. It's on par with any satirical book uh, ever written. It's such powerful literature, as well as, of course, powerful biblical and historical truth. And here we have Haman, who is the king can't sleep, and at the same time the king is, can't sleep, Haman wants to come early to talk to the king about his plan to hang Mordecai. <laughs> And before he can get his words out, the king's like, hey, Haman, what should I do for somebody I want to honor? Haman thinks it's him, comes up with this whole great plan to dress him in the king's robe, put him on a steed, and parade him around the city. And it turns out that the one that Haman hated, Mordecai, is the one that Haman now has to take around the city and proclaim. I mean, it's just, it's God's love and also his sense of humor on display. And we see a prophecy here in that from people who are not... Uh, followers of, that we know of, of the God of Scripture, but it says in verse 13, and Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai before whom you shall have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. So that's the first fall is, is this satire in chapter 6, and the second fall is a literal fall in which when Esther reveals the plan, and the king, you know, walks off in anger. He goes to, to Esther to, to beg for forgiveness and ask for mercy, and he literally falls on her. And in falling on her, it kind of shows his own doom, because when the king comes back, he sees it, and they hang him on the gallows. And so here's a, a representation of that. And uh, that can be found in Esther chapter 7. Esther chapter 7, and especially in verse, uh, verse 8, and I've highlighted there, oh, there we go. I've highlighted there where it says, and if Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was, the king said, what will he ever assault the queen in my presence? And then they decide, you're going to now die on the gallows that were for Mordecai. And this really is a picture of God's covenant love for the Jewish people, and that every, every country that ultimately comes against the Jewish people Falls, falls. And then here's a picture, this is a classic picture of, from the Reichstag, where the fall of Germany. This is uh, on, I believe it's May 1st, when uh, the, the Red Army takes Berlin and the end of Nazism in Germany. And of course, then we see the, the beginning of this epilogue and this re result of the book, and we see that Mordecai and Esther are exalted. And so we can, of course, hopefully, and, and we don't do it for this reason, but we can uh, potentially see reward. And so God's uh, covenant love revealed in Mordecai and Esther and the Jewish success and survival. And in Esther chapter 8, verse 2, it says, The king took all his signet ring when he had taken back from Haman, or Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, 
Esther then appointed Mordechai over Haman's estate. So Esther gets Haman's estate. Verse 7, King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordechai the Jew, I have decided to give Haman's estate to Esther and had him hanged on the gallows because he stretched out his hand. And so he gets, and uh, Mordechai is going to get the signet ring, and Mordechai is going to be an advisor to the king, or really, some would say even the prime minister. And in verse 3, 10 verse 3, here's this picture that I was telling you about, that God exalts, it appears, Jewish people to high places, or places of either political height or intellectual height, to help provide and protect uh, the Jewish people. And here we see Esther chapter 10 verse 3, the last verse of the book says, For Mordecai the Jew was second only to King Ahasuerus, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by the multitude of his people. He sought their good and spoke for the welfare of his descendants. And so, not only does it have to be a political leader, um, but it can also be a spiritual leader. And this is a famous Messianic Jew. We've had him at our congregation. Uh, he's since been with the Lord, but he's a Messianic Jew. He witnessed to both Jewish people and to atheists, Russians. He lived much of his life in the for there I go doing it again, the former Soviet Union. There we go. And so he he's somebody who desires to to bless his people. And so he was a uh, an evangelist to the Jewish people as well as to uh, the secular people of the Eastern Bloc. He suffered for the Lord. Um, but he, he never forgot his roots when he came to faith in Yeshua. And of course, here's a picture of the Jewish total victory. Esther chapter 9 reveals to us that, I think I'm on the, the last, let me make sure I've done all the, the fill-ins here. Um, we have uh, Mordecai and Esther's success, and we have God's covenant love revealed in Jewish Israel victory that ultimately God um, has a victory um, for those that love him, those that love his people, Jewish people, Israel, and, and really those that, that follow and serve him. You know, this, is, this book here shows the life, the history of the Jewish people in the diaspora, outside the land, which is um, every bit as important as those that are in the land. And we are a people we followers of Yeshua, in a sense, we're kind of in a diaspora. We're not in our eternal home yet. You know, our eternal Jerusalem still awaits. And we have King Ahasuerus out there who, you know, when you read and you look at the book and you see King Ahasuerus, he just seems like he's either drunk, he's out of it, he doesn't really get it, he doesn't know what's going on in his kingdom, but, but God can still move in his heart to do the right thing, like elevate Queen Esther and elevate Mordecai and, and pass a lot to protect and defend the Jewish people and allow them to defend themselves. And so we do, as we are in this diaspora, we're not in exile, we're not in bondage to sin anymore, we've been forgiven and delivered through the blood, the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, but we are in this kind of diaspora and we can be like Esther and Mordecai, we can aspire through God's grace and spirit to places where we can, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of our people. And every once in a while in this life, we might have to say as we fast and pray, if I perish, I perish, because it's what God's will has called us to do. And so I think for us as believers, you know, do we want to be like Esther and Mordecai? Again, even though God's name is not mentioned in this book, it's all over the book in the sense of how he's working and revealing his covenant love. And I think the height of it again is to be following the Lord in this place of diaspora, in, but, but spiritual peace. So physical diaspora, but spiritual peace with the Lord and let him make you his goodness and rise above our own nature to be self-preserving and protecting. And when we do make a mistake, we rent, our, or at least potential mistake, we rent our clothes, we mourn, we confess, we repent, and we get right back to the place where God has called us to be. I think that's at least one of the messages for us as believers. And if you're not yet a believer in Yeshua, you know, God has a will, and his will is for you to know Yeshua, and his will is for you also to live the life in this side of eternity 
that exemplifies his goodness. You can be forgiven of your sins and you can know, Yeshua, you can know eternal life through Yeshua, our Messiah, and you can live a life of, of greatness in him, in him. Maybe not the world's standard, but in his standard. And you can have true peace as you're doing it. You can be consequential for him. And, and, and that, that means in, your, in the peace of your heart. Let's pray. Abba Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this great book. There's so much to it, so much in it. We thank you for the traditions that remind us and make it fun and pleasurable and enjoyable. But we also pray, Lord God, that you would, by your grace, the power of your spirit, call us and make us and and form us into the Esther and the Mordechai to recognize the Hamans and to pray for the heart of the king, the magistrates, the mayors, and to not just go off in our own will, but to follow your will, no matter where it leads us. I pray for those that do not yet know you, that they would say, yes, I want that life. And they would pursue you. They would turn from their sin, turn to Yeshua, receive the Holy Spirit. And for those that know you, I pray you just continue to fill, that we would receive the Spirit, we would receive all the blessings of the covenantal love, and walk in that with joy and victory, no matter what's going on in our own lives or our environment or in the greater world, but we could just follow you, trust in you, and receive the assignments you have for us. We praise you and we thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. I'm going to ask you all to stand, and as you're standing, I'm going to do the, the benediction. Before I do, if you do have an offering and you want to put it in the, uh, the pushki or the offering box, you can go ahead and do so. Also, if you, um, and you can go out, the, the side doors will be open. You can go out any one of the, the side or the, the back doors, wherever you're closest. And of course, you know, talk to one another, get, see where everybody's at. I mean, that's the blessing that we're here to get. We're here today and, and encourage each other. You know, what is God doing in your life? Pray for one another and uh, let's be each other's brother and sister. Yivrech Adonai v'yishma recha Ya'er Adonai panavalecha v'ichunecha Yisadonai panavalecha V'yesem lecha shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you shalom, give you peace, and may you go forth in the joy, the gladness, and the power of the Lord. May he speak to your heart, and may you receive from heaven the life that he's called you to, and and embrace it, enjoy it, and fulfill it. I thank you, Lord, in advance that we will, and you will. Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat.